Welcome to this class on power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, there are a set of students in the recording room for this class. Also, this is being recorded for the in, uh, saving to the internet. So, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, in this course, we will be looking at distributed generation and in particular power electronics concepts which are important for distributed generation. Uh, power electronics is a wide area and it covers a large number of segments. Uh, a, a very widespread segment is uh, DC to DC converters uh, such as switch mode power supplies uh, which are used in computer power supplies, household equipment, a uh, wide range of uh, applications. Uh, then you have inverters which are extensively used in industrial applications, especially motor drives. Uh, then you have power quality equipment, a uh, very common power quality equipment that is used is a UPS to ensure that you have power availability even when there is some disturbance in the grid. Uh, also you have harmonic filters, you have uh, compensators uh, to uh, compensate wars, uh, compensate harmonics to adjust your voltage in the presence of sags, swells, etcetera. These are all power quality related uh, uh, segments for power electronics and at the very high power level you have uh, HVDC which is high voltage DC systems, uh, flexi flexible AC transmission systems uh, which are used at the very high power level. Uh, then uh, emerging area which uh, is gaining increasing importance is uh, distributed generation where the power converter or any converter in general is uh, used as a interface between your energy source and the grid. So, you have you can have power converters, you can have machine based uh, interfaces and in general you could call it a power conditioner which is used to interconnect a distributed generation unit with the electrical grid. There are many other applications of power electronics in high voltage pollution control, plasma generation, uh, many applications in medical imaging, uh, but the focus of this course will be on the, the distributed generation and uh, the issues of connecting the distributed generation unit uh, with the electric grid. If you look at the structure of the course, there will be three parts to the course. The first part is uh, looking at the power system related issues specifically relating to the distribution system and we will address the issue of why we need to look at the distribution system closely. And uh, there are many issues on a steady state basis how large a distributed generation, uh, generation source can be connected with the distribution system. Uh, also transients such as uh, a big transient is when a fault occurs on the distribution system and how would your distributed generation source in, uh, behave in the presence of such uh, transients. What is the strategy to deal with protection uh, especially when you have faults and one thing that can happen when you have additional sources in the distribution uh, system is that you have the potential to form an island. If you look at the traditional uh, uh, distribution system, the source is essentially the grid uh, coming from the substation coming to the feeder and uh, you have uh, a feeder coming from the substation to the individual loads. Uh, there may be distribution transformers coming to residential areas, commercial areas, uh, industrial areas and, uh, and you are looking at uh, how to interface such systems with the electric grid and we need to understand the distribution system related issues. The second uh, part of the course we look at uh, the issue of uh, comparison and benchmarking and the reason this is important is you can have a wide variety of uh, distributed generation sources, you can have wide variety of 
interconnection systems, uh, power electronic circuits, different circuits which can do the interconnection. And the question is, are the type of systems that you are considering, is it actually improving the situation or are, are you going backwards? Okay. So, it is important to come up with a way of quantifying how good your uh, interconnection system is to make sure that you are going in the right direction. And so, it becomes important to actually uh, come up with a method to evaluate the value of what you are doing and then make a decision is this change that you are making taking you in the right direction. And this becomes an important issue where often you have to compare the distributed generation source with the traditional electric grid and the question is, is it giving you something better or are you, are you going in a direction where things are getting worse. The third part of the course is uh, related to the power electronic design issues where we look at the power electronic circuits for distributed generation applications. We will look at single phase, uh, three phase, uh, different topologies, uh, the basics of the topologies and the components that go into a, a typical power electronic circuit and the components that would go in a typical power electronic circuit, they are essentially inductors, capacitors and switches. You would not intentionally put a resistor in a power electronic circuit because it is a dissipative source. So, the question is what sort of uh, inductors, what sort of uh, capacitors, uh, how do you rate them, how do you size them, what sort of semiconductors, how do you rate them and size them uh, should go into such an equipment. Okay. Uh, there are implications of the selection in terms of both efficiency and reliability and ideally there is no loss in a inductor, capacitor or switch, but you always have non-idealities in a practical circuit. So, the in a practical circuit you will have losses and there are uh, implications of loss. One is you lose the generated power that you are generating in your generation source in loss and you have poor efficiency that is one impact. The second impact typically is you have more loss, it means that you need more thermal management uh, and your components can get hot which can have reliability implications. So, the parasitics of the power uh, converter component selection has implications in terms of both reliability and efficiency and that has to be considered when you actually do the design. So, that you are taking the overall picture into mind rather than just uh, does this component work. Then we will also to some limited extent look at modeling and control related issues of such a system. If you look at the typical background required for the course, uh, at IAC over here we have uh, students who come in for a master's degree or for research degrees. Uh, they would have already done courses in power electronics, they would have had courses in power systems. So, uh, uh, introductory level you would have a power electronics course, you would have power systems course which gives you some exposure to dis distribu uh, distribution systems. You would have done courses on switch mode power electronics, you would have done courses which help model motors. So, you would have courses on motor drives. And the idea of this uh, particular course is to take in aspects of power electronics, some amount of machines and uh, power systems and look at the issues when you actually interconnect a distributed generation source with the grid. Also at IIC we have courses on uh, details of the power converter such as how do you modulate the power converter. Uh, you also have courses on advanced drives where you look at uh, details about control related modeling issues. So, the idea is at this particular point the student can look at research related issues or uh, some, of some particular uh, topic which you may want to investigate in detail and uh, hopefully this background will give you the necessary tool to actually go in the uh, 
uh, direction of uh, looking at power electronics and distributed generation. So, we talked about three aspects of uh, this course. So, the first aspect was power systems related and uh, the, as we mentioned the fault is a severe tra transient and you need to actually deal with a fault in a power convert uh, in a distributed generation system. And one of the basic requirement would be that you have the existing distribution system with its protection philosophy and you do not want to modify the existing protection system when you add in the distributed generation source. So, suppose you have to rewire the whole distribution feeder when you connect your uh, solar inverter that would bring in a big cost to the overall society just because a person wants to add a distributed generation source. So, you want your source to work in tandem with the existing system and you do not want to modify the existing system when you introduce the new sources. Some of the background that you would use when you look at say for example, uh, fault studies is uh, you would typically do a per unit analysis to actually evaluate what the fault levels are, what the uh, voltages and currents in the system are. The, so, this would be something that you would have from your power systems uh, background. You also make use of uh, symmetrical components extensively to analyze uh, uh, faults. Uh, very common fault is a single phase fault. Uh, so, uh, such methods are can be useful when you are analyzing distributed generation system and its uh, impact on the existing system. Then another important uh, scenario is when you have an additional source in addition to the main grid which is uh, which rep represents the feeder coming in from the substation. Uh, if the feeder gets opened for some reason maybe a upstream breaker is opened then you have to consider what happens to the protection system if now a new source is actually holding up a portion of the feeder as an island will the protection that was envisaged with to work with the original uh, uh, substation based protection would it still work when you are operating as an island. So, these are some of the concerns that traditional utility engineers have when people uh, want to connect uh, distributed generation sources will the existing method of working will it be severely impacted by adding the distributed generation unit. So, if you look at uh, uh, if you look at the structure of the power system uh, people like to talk about uh, distributed generation as uh, something similar to uh, the old centralized computers versus the newer network of uh, computers. Uh, to some extent uh, that comparison might be, uh, might be valid. Uh, if you look at the overall power system, if you look at the uh, sources in the traditional power system, uh, they are shown as the generators uh, over at the very top. Then you connect the generators to the a meshed transmission system where you have power flows which can be bidirectional from one, one side to the other side. You also have sub transmission systems which might be at a lower voltage level compared to the main power grid uh, which then connects to distribution systems. And traditionally you did not have uh, the distributed generators connected to the distribution feeders and the power flow from your uh, distribution on your distribution system from the distribution transformer onwards was unidirectional. But now when you have uh, a DG source connected you are, are looking at the potential for bidirectional power flow even on your radial system distribution systems and this has implications. Okay. If you look at uh, the, the voltages uh, uh, and the role of power electronics at the different levels of such a system, you have 
at the uh, traditional generator you might have uh, the generators operating at 11 kV, maybe 20 kV and you step it up to the transmission level with a step up transformer. The role of power electronics at this level might be in the exciters of large syn synchronous generators. There may be some power electronics in the, uh, in the governor systems, uh, but it is not a major uh, player at this particular point in the generator. Uh, if you look at the transmission systems, the voltages are uh, quite high, you are talking about 400 kV and when people talk about ultra high voltage, you are talking about 1200 kV etcetera. And at this level, you have uh, uh, HVDC systems, fax systems which use very high power uh, power electronics. Your tra sub -trans uh, transmission system is at a, a slightly lower voltage. Uh, and even in this particular level, you, the role of power electronics would be uh, in, the, in HVDC and fax at different voltage levels. When you look at the distribution, traditionally distribution is 11 kV, uh, can also be at 33 kV uh, level and when it comes down to the consumption point, it is typically uh, 415 volts, uh, 3 phase or uh, 230 volts single phase. So, the traditional role of power electronics uh, has been in loads, uh, be it a switch mode power supply, uh, motor drive uh, at the load level at the consumption point. But when you are talking about distributed generation, you are talking about potentially connecting it at the consumption level or at the distribute distribution level. So, this is essentially the range of uh, areas where people are looking at distributed generation solutions. So, uh, so, if you look at the way of interconnecting uh, uh, distributed generation systems, so people talk about now having a network of sources connected at the uh, close to the loads. Uh, one thing when you have a computer network, the constraints is constraint is on the flow of information and uh, the limits on those constraints are, uh, are quite challenging, but if you look at the, the constraints that govern the, f uh, the connection of distributed generation sources, it is not just uh, the information required to control the source. Uh, you also have the physical uh, circuit loss which uh, govern the power flow, you have the thermal management required to allow the power to actually come through. Uh, so, you have a lot more physical constraints in the network of energy sources. So, I would say even though people talk about the analogy, it is actually a much tougher problem when you are looking at a network of uh, energy sources and it is still at the stage of infancy compared to the mature level that the network of information systems uh, are at today. The, 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 the concept of unidirectional versus uh, power, uh, bidirectional power flow has uh, quite a lot of uh, implications. Uh, just again on the previous slide, I just want to point out just because you have uh, a lot of people associate distributed generation with uh, solar energy or wind energy, but that is not necessarily true all the time. I mean if you look at large wind farms, uh, they might be uh, even though the individual turbine might be rated at uh, a couple of megawatts, the wind farm might be rated at uh, 250 megawatts or 300 megawatts, they would be con connected to the sub transmission or the transmission level. So, the wind energy need not be distributed uh, generation. Uh, similarly, if you look at some of the newer solar power plants, they are uh, rated at tens of megawatts uh, especially at the larger range. So, they can be considered as uh, more like uh, centralized generation rather than distributed generation. Okay. So, when you are talking about the scope of DG systems, you are talking about the power levels that are compatible with the distribution feeders or at the consumption point and it is not about the type of source, it is not about solar energy or 
renewable energy often if you, you can have a diesel generator sitting over here which is sending power to the load and it, uh, it's a non-renewable uh, fuel but it is distributed generation because of the way in which it is connected and the fact that uh, it is distributed in two ways one is it's connected at the distribution level or at the consumption level the second thing is it's uh, geographically distributed rather th than being centralized in large individual point centralized power plants so uh, uh, so it's good to have uh, clarity on the difference between the type of source and whether it is distributed generation or not just because you have one variety of source it doesn't mean uh, distributed generation so if you look at the issue of power flow in a typical distribution system you have uh, uh, simplicity of uh, the system of the distribution system and if you look at uh, a mesh system where you have uh, possibility of power coming in from multiple sources then you have a scenario where say you have two sources suppose you have a fault over here uh, at the center of the line then to clear the fault you need to actually open say the breaker 1 and breaker 2 to actually clear that fault because just opening one breaker is not sufficient you need to disconnect all the sources uh, to actually clear the fault. If you look at the traditional uh, uh, di uh, distribution system uh, you might have a breaker uh, uh, at CB3 and say you have a fault somewhere down on the feeder and you have to open just one breaker and you can actually clear the fault on the feeder which means that there is actually a lot of simplicity over here the protection equipment is actually reduced by half in this particular case you need just one breaker compared to multiple breakers in the, uh, the other scenario. And also as you proceed along this particular uh, uh, feeder the ratings uh, reduce as you go further down the feeder uh, as the loads are uniform typically connected uniformly across the length of the feeder. So the rating of something which is much closer over here would be higher the ratings that are towards the mid middle of the fe feeder would be lower. So you have simplicity and uh, cost reduction in a num number of ways. So, if you now connect say a distributed generation source over here then you have this issue that now to clear a fault that you had on the on the DG system uh, you have the issue that you had in this pr previous case where if you just open this breaker there is now the potential that this DG source would actually feed the fault and then you have now uh, the issue of being able to coordinate multiple DG source is not just one potential source every customer on that feeder might potentially connect uh, DG and you need to make sure that uh, those sources get disconnected when the protection uh, philosophy of the feeder has to actually kick in. So these are some of the concerns of uh, not just simplicity but also the cost impact of uh, trying to actually connect uh, more sources into a distribution uh, system. And so you need to actually now bring in the DG such that you can have the existing distribution system uh, because you cannot afford to put more uh, protective devices or increase the cost of the, the existing feeder. You have to actually operate the DG in such a manner that it should not interfere with the existing protection philosophy of the feeder. So, if you then look at uh, the second aspect of uh, what we will cover in this course, uh, it is related to the engineering economic aspects of uh, connecting a distributed generation source and 
if you look at uh, re, uh, last year or uh, two years back, though there were people like to provide lists of what are the grand challenges in facing humanity, and uh, one challenge was actually not just saying let us have solar power happen, uh, but to make it actually cost competitive. So, the big challenge is not uh, just building a solar inverter, there are actually uh, thousands, tens of thousands of solar inverters out there. The, uh, the challenge is actually to make it uh, cheaper than coal, okay, which is actually a very uh, cheaper source of power. So, if you can actually make solar energy lower cost. So, without actually thinking about what are the implications of your power electronics or the source uh, changes or the way you are doing the interconnection, if unless you are able to boil it down to a cost, uh, you will not be able to address this issue of because the real challenge is at the how to actually roll in the cost. Okay. So, can it be done? It can be done. There are thousands of uh, people who have already done it. And the issue is, can it be done in a cost effective manner? Okay. And you have a number of trade offs in this particular uh, consideration of cost. If you look at a typical system, uh, if you want to make some component more efficient, you typically end up paying a higher cost for it. Okay. If you look at an example of uh, of say a simple wire, I mean if you have a wire of, uh, of some particular cross section and area of diameter say D and uh, you will have the resistance R 1 uh, of a wire of diameter uh, D 1 and uh, so it is say R 1 ohms and D 1 is the cross section area of the wire and say you want to reduce the loss in that particular wire and you decide to double the diameter. So, if you double the diameter, the area of cross section would go up by a factor of uh, 4. So, your resistance would come down uh, by a factor of 4. So, you are at the handling the same level of current, your power loss would come down by a factor of 4. But if you look at the cost of the copper that is used in that wire which is twice the diameter, the volume has now gone up by a factor of 4. So, you can see that your cost has gone up, your efficiency has gone up, but your cost has gone up. So, if you look at the, the issue of uh, uh, cost versus, uh, if, uh, uh, versus uh, losses, you have a situation where if you look at uh, some parameter, maybe the diameter. Uh, if you are willing to pay a higher cost, then your losses can come down. So, the question is uh, how much additional cost are you willing to tolerate uh, to bring the loss down to some particular level. Uh, at this particular point, you, you can actually increase the cost by a small amount and get a bigger uh, benefit of uh, uh, loss reduction or efficiency improvement. Whereas, over here you might uh, not get much in terms of efficiency improvement, but your cost has, uh, is going up quite rapidly. So, you have to actually make an engineering decision what is appropriate even at the sim simple case of selecting a wire. Okay. And similar implications are there when you are selecting uh, magnetic components, whether you are selecting capacitors, uh, power semiconductor switches, etcetera, where there is a trade off between cost and uh, the ratings of the components that you are selecting. And uh, uh, this is one factor that you need to keep in mind. Uh, so, just improving the efficiency forever will not take you in the right direction. You have to ask yourself is this efficiency improvement? Uh, being uh, coming in at the appropriate uh, uh, cost. Not all situations of efficiency improvement is associated with increased cost. You might have a situation where you get both uh, increase in efficiency and a reduction in cost simultaneously 
so in that case it is a win win situation you have to go for it. Suppose you have a, uh, a system where you have power being processed in uh, power converter 1 and then it is being processed in power converter 2 and if by some simplicity of design you could actually merge it together and still retain the efficiency of uh, processing it in multiple instead of processing it in multiple stages then you might be able to see whether you can actually get lower cost because you are eliminating uh, one big uh, component and simultaneously you are reducing the cost associated with a big component. Uh, so, you have situations where you definitely have to choose a design based on uh, what would definitely give you benefit, but often in engineering you have situations like this where you are looking at uh, a trade off between uh, what you what additional amount you are willing to pay and what is the uh, benefit you are getting out of it. Similarly, if you look at uh, uh, the issue of uh, reliability, if you want to get improved reliability, uh, you may want you may have to end up paying a higher cost. Okay. For example, if you in the case of uh, example about uh, the, the wire that we just discussed, if you have a situation where uh, because of the increased losses in the narrow wire, your wire temperature is high, the higher temperature would lead to poorer reliability. Okay. So, if, you, uh, if the higher temperature poorer reliability would mean that you would have higher failure rate. Uh, and uh, shorter uh, mean times between repair etcetera. So, if you want to improve reliability you would then go in for uh, a thicker wire which means that you are paying a higher cost. So, if you look at again the, the trade off that can potentially happen in such a situation you are looking at uh, say uh, a, a trade off such as uh, some component parameter such as the diameter and on the one hand if you are uh, looking at uh, the if you are increasing the diameter your cost is going up, but your uh, your uh, uh, your mean time between failures uh, say 1 by uh, lambda would actually come down because you are having a more reliable component. Okay. So, so you also have this trade off between uh, reliability and uh, cost. So, if you are designing a power electronic component and you want it to last for so many years, uh, if you reduce the cost there is a chance that you would uh, the component might fail before it reaches the desired uh, lifetime. And often in power, power generation systems you are talking about power plants with 20 or 30 years of life. So, can we meet the life of uh, 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 say for example, you build a, a dam you want it to last for 50 years or 100 years. Uh, if you are talking about a nuclear power plant you are talking about 50, 40 to 60 years. So, depending uh, if you are looking at a uh, wind turbine people are looking at wind turbines which can last for 20 to 30 years. So, if you look at solar panels, solar panels can actually last for a long time. The question is will the electronics that go along with the panel last for as long as the panel uh, does. So, this issue of uh, trade off between reliability and uh, cost also exists. Uh, and the, uh, there may be other considerations too such as uh, uh, what is the, the weight or volume of a component. Uh, for, for example, if you want to make something more compact or extremely lightweight, you may have to end up paying more. And uh, applications such as uh, uh, say, uh, uh, say transportation is a place where they place a lot of emphasis on volume and weight. For example, if you had a solar converter and you wanted to install it uh, in your hostel 
and if the solar inverter was the size of Almara, you would say no I cannot enter my room when the solar inverter is so big. Uh, whereas, if it is the size of maybe a, a cell phone or a laptop, then you do not mind having a panel outside your window because it is not taking much space. Uh, similar I mean so you want to have there is a, a benefit of reducing your uh, volume and weight. Uh, for example, when you uh, talk of an application like uh, transportation say a aircraft or a satellite, uh, size and weight is extremely important. So, when you uh, want to fly somewhere the, uh, the aircraft uh, the, 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 the companies that uh, take you there will weigh your baggage and see whether it is under 20 kgs. Uh, if it is more than 20 kgs, they will charge you some extra for carrying a heavier bag or if your bag is too big, they will not allow you to check it in. So, they operate under tight constraints of size and volume and the, uh, the implications of size and volume say on a power converter sitting in a, a aircraft or a satellite is it will cause uh, more fuel consumption in the aircraft. So, there is actually a cost impact of uh, size and weight which needs to be considered when you are designing uh, your engineering system. And you can see that uh, you make a purchase decision based on say initial cost, but if you forget about uh, efficiency or reliability or how, how uh, what the size or weight is, then you are not actually taking in the overall picture. Okay. So, you need to actually roll in the different aspects of design including uh, efficiency, reliability, weight, uh, uh, transportation constraints, the uh, reliability has implications on how often you do servicing. Uh, so, many of these things have to be rolled into a single metric and then you make a comparison the design that you are doing is it uh, heading in the right direction or not. Okay. So, the metric that you would use might give more weightage to say weight and volume may be in a, a aircraft application. It might give more uh, weightage to efficiency and reliability in uh, say application such as uh, uh, long duration industrial power systems. So, uh, there can be uh, different ways of weighing things in but uh, a, a methodology to actually bring this all together is important for any uh, engineering design. The third part of the course is uh, uh, about the power electronic details. We will be looking at uh, the characteristics of power converters, the topologies, uh, the requirement of uh, filtering the, the output of the power converter. Uh, you do not want your uh, neighbor's uh, computer to shut down every time your solar panel on the roof generates power. So, you want uh, tight filtering uh, and you want it to be compatible with the things that are there around you. Uh, so, we will look at uh, filtering the way you modulate the switches, uh, what is its impact on a common mode and a differential mode uh, basis. And we look at uh, things like how to select the DC bus. Uh, often you use, a, uh, if you use a voltage source converter, you are talking about how to select the DC bus, uh, uh, primarily the DC bus capacitors for such a power converter. Uh, how do you select the semiconductors? This has uh, implications on not just the temperature of the uh, semiconductor junction, but uh, what is the cycle life of say a given package of the semiconductor. Uh, also with uh, any power converter you uh, it is not just uh, the main power circuit components, there is a lot of aux uh, ancillary hardware. You have sensors, you have protection components in your uh, power converter, you have your controllers, it might be uh, small analog controllers or more sophisticated digital controllers. You have breakers and contactors that need to operate when you uh, are running the power converter. You need to handle surges, you might have some surge protectors, you need to precharge your uh, power circuit components and you also need to provide control power to your uh, circuit boards that are there within your power converter. 
So, all these uh, ancillary components are important for proper operation of the power converter. Uh, if you look at the control related aspects, uh, we will to some extent we will look at uh, the switching and average models. Uh, some of the important requirements are to uh, be able to do uh, things like phase locking, uh, how to control the current that is coming out of your uh, distributed generation unit, uh, how do you control the, the DC bus. Uh, how do you control the real and reactive power coming out of uh, your, uh, your uh, power conditioning unit. So, these are issues that are control related which we will uh, try to address to some extent. If you look at uh, power quality related issues, uh, uh, one of the first question is how do you measure uh, what is uh, power quality and uh, we will have some discussion about that and that is important to uh, make a justification to add equipment which is uh, 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 addressing power quality issues such as uh, UPS. Uh, you also have power quality is not, power quality is not just an issue from the customer side. Uh, so, a customer side power quality issue is, uh, is there a power cut or a outage. Whereas, you can also have power quality from the provider side where uh, a customer load is drawing a lot of uh, harmonics or a, a customer load is highly unbalanced. So, it is a power quality issue which is impacting the, the provider. So, power quality is not just one sided issue, it, you have to look at it from both sides from both the loads and the sources and ensure that overall the system uh, is in good shape. You also have issues like flicker which comes up when you have uh, periodic uh, power injection into a node. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to deal with sags, swells, surges in a real, uh, 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 real grid and uh, you also have to look at what are the ranges of frequencies that uh, you would need to operate and how to operate within uh, that particular range appropriately. If you look at uh, the issue of uh, uh, efficiency of uh, uh, the distributed generation versus the centralized uh, uh, generation, you can have a variety uh, a range of uh, range of efficiency over here depending on the type of plant whether it is uh, just a boiler uh, running a turbine or it is uh, uh, got different stages of uh, which can help improve the efficiency uh, or whether it is a natural gas power plant where you can have uh, improved efficiency. You also have losses in transmission systems, losses in the distribution system and then finally, at the consumption point you are talking about overall power uh, from the fuel to the actual uh, energy that is delivered you are talking about something in the range of uh, 20 to 40 percent. Okay. Uh, if you have a, a, a generator source which is sitting close to your point of consumption, you can have if you are just providing the electrical energy output to the, your load, then you could have similar levels of efficiency. But in addition to the electrical energy that is being provided to the load, if you can make use of the waste heat in the load for some purpose, uh, then you can actually have better overall uh, uh, fuel to end use efficiency and uh, such systems are uh, typically called cogeneration systems. And uh, the, the comparison of efficiency between the centralized and the distributed is not that uh, straightforward. For example, if you have a centralized system because it is uh, a very large uh, power source, you can actually uh, uh, make use of generators with uh, high performance components with uh, high better cooling etcetera to actually improve the efficiency at the uh, large centralized generator making use of the economies of scale. Whereas, you may not be able to increase the cost of this generator th to that extent. So, you have some advantages because of higher performance of systems and thermal management in the centralized method of generation. But if you are looking at it from a distance po point of view, uh, you 
have definitely advantages for the uh, distributed generation type of uh, uh, sources. And making use of the waste heat at the point of consumption will actually give you a big boost in terms of uh, increasing your overall efficiency. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Professor Amulya Reddy who use, who set up the Center for Sustainable Studies in uh, IAC, he had an acronym, uh, he used to call it DEFENDERS which is development focused end user oriented and service directed energy sources and such sources fit in more with the distributed generation paradigm. And the idea is that say if you are providing uh, say lighting solutions to a rural household, uh, there is definitely development, there is possibly more work that uh, person such a person can do and it provides a direct service. So, uh, there are advantages to the distributed generation paradigm even when uh, some of the initial costs might appear to be higher. Okay. And overall the fuel to load efficiency is an important aspect to be kept in mind when you are looking at uh, or comparing these systems. Uh, another uh, aspect is about uh, reliability when you are look comparing the centralized uh, approach versus the distributed approach. The centralized uh, power system is, uh, uh, is uh, covers a much wider area. So, it is uh, geographically more exposed to problems such as in, uh, environmental or lightning, rain, pollution, etcetera. So, you can have faults because of a uh, number of reasons such as this or your distribution systems might have trees that are close by which cause periodic falls. You might have squirrels or birds coming and sitting in and uh, you, know, you have situations such as that. You have poor loads on your mm -hmm. distribution systems. Uh, for example, in on a distribution feeder, you might have maybe a hundred uh, distribution transformers and from each distribution transformer, you might have uh, many tens of uh, loads. So, your and each consumption load might be a household or a commercial establishment and e each household you might have uh, tens or many tens of loads. So, if you are looking at the actual load connection to the physical uh, distribution system, it is a very large number. So, even if a load has a failure of once in 5 years, if you have many thousands of loads, these faults are occurring all the time and you need to be able to deal with that. Uh, especially when, when it is spread out around in a large geographical manner. Uh, and so, your, your transmission and distribution system traditionally <coughs> is more exposed to the problems, but uh, on the flip side you can make use of higher performance materials and components on a larger scale. Con uh, you can have more sophisticated control and protection packages in the centralized uh, system where it may be justified based on economies of scale. Whereas, uh, in DG systems, it is co typically co-located with the load which means that it is less, <coughs> less exposed to external disturbances. And so, uh, you can tune your reliability to match your load requirement rather than make it all very high or all very low. You can actually try to match the reliability, reliability requirement of the source with the load. And often uh, DG is also uh, people use it as a backup system when you do not have power from the grid. So, uh, if overall if you look at uh, uh, from the efficiency perspective and from the reliability perspective, uh, what uh, I believe is important is not that one method of uh, addressing generation will solve all problems. It is uh, a way in which you need to design your system such that uh, both centralized and distributed generation has, uh, they have to co coexist. So, it is not that uh, the centralized system would go away and you would have only distributed sources or you would never have distributed sources and everything is solved in a centralized manner. You need to have uh, engineering architecture where both systems can actually coexist. So, if you look at uh, the 
uh, so we looked at it from a efficiency and uh, reliability perspective. If you look at uh, the typical upfront cost perspective, uh, scale actually favors uh, centralized uh, power plant where you have larger ratings of the centralized power plants whereas the smaller ratings of the DG unit. So, you have benefits of efficiency economies of scale up to some extent. Once you go to very gigantic sizes then again you have problems, but uh, when you are talking about typical DG and uh, centralized systems, uh, you are uh, talking about benefits of uh, uh, efficiencies of scale for the centralized uh, systems. Uh, if you look at renewable DG systems like uh, roo rooftop solar or combined heat and power uh, uh, systems, uh, they uh, are of a lower rating typically maybe for a household or commercial rating. So, you cannot use the level of sophistication or the advanced materials, you may not be able to use hydrogen cooling for example, to cool the conductors of a residential uh, uh, a synchronous machine whereas, you could actually easily use that, it is typically used in a large centralized generator. So, whether it is D again as we mentioned uh, the DG does not have to be always in a renewable, it need not always be a centralized uh, power uh, I mean solar uh, rooftop solar, it might be a small g diesel generator that you have uh, in your commercial establishment which you use as a, a generation source either as a backup or it may be used for some additional functionality depending on the type of uh, interconnection or power conditioning device. Uh, so, again if you look at uh, the economic uh, economics of scale issue uh, for each uh, distributed generation uh, system you need to actually duplicate control and protection and uh, so you have some impact over there but it is becoming less important uh, uh, nowadays as uh, you have sophisticated digital controllers which can handle not just the control of the DG unit, but also many aspects of uh, the protection can be integrated into a single processor. So, the uh, you can actually have quite sophisticated protection and control methodologies even at uh, lower power scales with uh, the newer digital controllers. If you look at efficiency from the component efficiency point of view, from the machine efficiency point of view, you have advantages for the centralized power method of generation, whereas the overall efficiency especially if you are making use of waste heat, you have advantage for the distributed type of solution. Again from you, when you look at the reliability from the use of high performance materials or cooling, you have advantages to the centralized power plant. But uh, reliability is not just uh, having high uh, uptime, but if you look at uh, reliability in terms of redundancy, uh, you have say for example, if one large uh, generator in a, a power coal plant or a goes down, you lose a large amount of generation. Whereas, if one turbine out of 250 turbines come down in a, a wind farm, you might lose 2 megawatts out of 250 megawatts. So, the redundancy actually gives you benefit in uh, some of these uh, methods. So, uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the societal needs for distributed generation, there are many issues which makes energy a pressing topic. It is an issue from the source side where you have concerns of resource de uh, de uh, depletion, you have concerns from the sink side after you make use of uh, the energy. Uh, how do you deal with things like carbon dioxide which is essentially addressing climate change issues. You also have issues of power quality, is there energy at all in the first place? I mean the there is a very big societal cost for of poor power quality or lack of electricity being available is actually a big cost. Uh, so, uh, overall uh, some for this course we do not have a standard textbook. Uh, we will be looking at uh, papers from journals, uh, we might make use of data sheets or technical reports from companies. You can make use of your uh, power electronics uh, or your power systems textbook uh, that you use in your uh, undergrad or in your courses that you would have done 
in your first and second semester. Uh, uh, the first uh, couple of books, uh, one by Professor David McKay, uh, uh, and the second uh, by uh, Emery Levens, uh, they are actually more general reading. Uh, you do not need to have much uh, technical background to actually read uh, these things. Maybe, maybe your, you can ask your uh, parents or relatives to also read it, they might be able to comfortably read, read those books. Okay. Uh, so, this is similar in line to the small is profitable, similar to small is beautiful uh, paradigm that uh, E. F. Schumacher used to uh, had a book, uh, Small is Be Beautiful. So, this is the overall. Uh, 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 introduction for the course. In the next class, we will look at uh, specific uh, distributed generation technologies and how power electronics has an important role in those technologies. Thank you.